Thank you for inviting me. It's a pretty exciting for me to talk to guys in Brazil because I, 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 I left Brazil a long time ago and uh, never presented back uh, anything. And I think you, uh, it would be very useful for you to learn about this technology. Uh, so uh, Temporal, uh, what is Temporal? Uh, Temporal is an open source project uh, which uh, has MIT license. So it's a pretty permissive license. Any of you can use it. Uh, without talking to us. Uh, and um, I have these links in the presentation. If you want to reach us, I think it's important to be able to reach our community and uh, just learn about the technology. So I think this is the most important slide of this presentation. If you like what I'm, we, we describe and uh, or, um, get, get questions, you can always reach us there. Um, before just talking about the technology, it's just people say that you re really want to have some social proof. Uh, that uh, it's not just that some fringe project which somebody created that it's actually used by real companies in production and uh, we have a bunch of case studies and also uh, it's this is a snapshot from from our page um, like our main uh, home page and you can see links to uh, other companies talking about our open source uh, certainly um, we are very proud that uh, companies like Netflix HashiCorp Datadog DoorDash Checker like Coinbase uh, use our solution in production uh, for uh, mission critical use cases. Um, so uh, one thing is that this project is not something which was dreamed overnight. It took a very long time to mature and uh, get uh, it, it was it went through multiple iterations. I, I worked for Amazon for a long time over eight years and uh, I was tech lead for the Amazon messaging platform. So this is practically pops up type uh, solution, which Amazon used uh, internally to for all microservices to communicate. And micro, uh, Amazon was one of the first companies which introduced uh, my, uh, services at scale. So practically the whole backend of the um, Amazon was uh, comprised from uh, hundreds and hundreds of uh, services. Back then they weren't called microservices, they were just called services at the end of 90s and beginning of 2000s. And uh, later that um, PubSub system was also used as a backend for the simple queue service, Amazon Web, Web Services, uh, simple queue service. And I was tech lead for that project, uh, for the storage, storage of that system. Being tech lead for the open source, uh, um, like for, not sorry, open source, being tech lead for the uh, messaging platform taught us pretty fast that queues are awesome and they're required if you wanna do uh, large scale uh, backend systems but they're actually very low level abstraction uh they it's very very hard to create complex applications on top of microservices uh in a synchronous manner if you all you have is queues because you probably need to create this uh, complex um like uh, what um, applications and you don't get visibility and how to troubleshoot out of that effort we decided that we want to build an orchestrator and uh, the result of that was the Amazon Simple Workflow Service, which was launched uh, in, like in 2004, uh, uh, not 2004, sorry. It was uh, in 2012, I think. And uh, it took uh, um, uh, the Simple Workflow Service, I was the lead for that, uh, introduced a few very powerful uh, ideas and it's still a public database service. You can uh, um, check it out on the Amazon website. Uh, later, uh, the um, co-founder of Temporal, Samar, uh, went to, uh, back to Microsoft, where he's originally from. And uh, he was tech lead for the Azure Service Bus, but he also built Azure Durable Task Framework, which later was adopted by Azure Functions. And now uh, Azure has Azure Durable Functions, which run on that framework. And by coincidence, we joined Uber in 2015. And we worked on a couple of projects. One was Jeremy, which was a messaging system. But out of that project grew a uh, Cadence project. And Cadence was uh, re re uh, the implementation of an orchestrator based on the ideas of the Amazon Simple Workflow Service. It uh, became pretty popular uh, uh, inside and outside of Uber. And within three years, over 100 projects within Uber were using that. Now I think it's much more. And uh, it also started to pick up adoption. I mentioned some companies in the previous slide which uh, started to adopt that. And uh, in 2019, we, we, we quit Uber and started the company called Temporal. And Temporal is a fork of Cadence. It's a kind of continuation of Cadence ideas. It's still open source project, still MIT license. And this is what I'm going to talk about. 
Uh, I, I think the reason I show you this timeline is that just to say that there was practically uh, 15 years of uh, iterations and uh, mistakes and different uh, approaches we took before we've got what we've got and uh, provide the model which we are selling. It's not like it was very, it wasn't like very short path really. Uh, let's look at from a real example. Um, and uh, everybody does money transfers as an example of a transaction. And uh, as you know, uh, now we are moving to microservices. And if you want to implement uh, kind of the transferring money, withdrawing money from one banking service and depositing to another service, uh, na naively we can just write a service which will do that. The problem is that if you do withdraw operation, as there are no transactions across the services, and if your service fails in the middle of deposit operation, you end up in an inconsistent state. And it's a very serious problem. And uh, I previous talk mentioned that, that uh, there is an inherent complexity in dividing your business logic for, and moving from monolith to, um, multi, uh, to the distributed systems based on microservices. And the, one of the core problems is exactly that uh, consistency becomes very hard. And uh, how do you solve this? Uh, engineers usually start, uh, uh, we are engineers, we, uh, we, we have our components and how have our tricks. Usually you start using a database. So practically you start checkpointing state of your request, long running requests uh, to the database. And then if uh, uh, something fails, you will go and uh, practically use database to recover state from that. It, but it, it makes your uh, application much more complex because at this point you're not running this, uh, writing these two lines of code which I described. Uh, but at this point you're practically writing a state machine. So your application becomes a, a quadmire of callbacks and uh, practically most of them will load state from the database, update state back to the database, deal with that and so on. This so application becomes much more, more complex. Then you also need to deal with threading because you want to have multiple of those requests going at the same time. You need to deal with uh, durable timers and retries because uh, if your application goes down and you come back, you need to check uh, for timeouts and so on. And uh, uh, you all need to implement that on top of database. Sometimes people use timer services like Quartz, but it still it adds complexity. And uh, at some point, uh, you cannot fit all these uh, requests in a single uh, process, so you need to kind of shard them across multiple processes which introduces a whole set of uh, problems, especially if you're running asynchronous applications and you need to kind of cache, cache a lot of state. So if you, if you have caching, you start introducing sharding. Sharding usually requires another kind of subsystem like Zookeeper to be able to move those shards and allocate those shards to hosts. And then uh, usually database becomes a bottleneck because if, for example, if your uh, co company is successful, your traffic uh, to your website grows, uh, a single database cannot keep up with the load, especially uh, as it's not very efficient to implement this type of applications because they require a lot of pooling, for example, for timers. At this point, we usually introduce sharding and we know about, all know about sharded databases, uh, but it also adds complexity to the solution. And then we usually don't call uh, downstream services directly. We use some sort of queue, is it either RabbitMQ or Kafka or a simple queue service from or other queue service from some cloud provider. And uh, this kind of works, but uh, the problem is that, uh, remember that we, we actually did all of that for practically two lines of code, which was <laughs> withdraw and deposit. And uh, I've seen this architecture repeated in different forms and shapes thousands of times in different companies from like uh, own experience in companies I worked and uh, uh, users of our open source and clients of our company. And uh, the problem is that people repeat this architecture or redo this architecture in some shape or form uh, every time because every new applications you have to reinvent that because you have this low level components like database, like a queue, like Zookeeper and so on and you have to kind of implement and implement that. And it's all for these two, two simple lines of code. And, uh, and then you have to deal with race conditions because for example, uh, there is no uh, usually transaction between Kafka and the database. So if you start uh, writing your application just using them directly, you have, will, will have all sorts of race conditions because you will, can put message in a Kafka and the database transaction fails. Or database, uh, if you do it reverse, you can update database and then put message in Kafka. You can end up losing, um, like, uh, there are all sorts of uh, database transactions can go through and then Kafka message 
is not is not enqueued so you will lose messages so there are all sorts of race conditions you have to deal with and usually applications still have them and then uh, i can introduce the problem and temporal is actually the solution to this problem so what is temporal temporal is an orchestration engine which allows you to write your orchestration as code uh, and the code is just normal code in the programming language here i give samples in java but we have sdks in other languages and what it means that the example I gave you, uh, by code I put there, you can write it as it is. Like you don't need to change that. You just save as raw and deposit. And uh, what Temporal will do, it has a service which allows you to kind of execute, uh, uh, keep state and um, timers and queues and events for that uh, execute uh, that program. And it allows you to uh, not to deal with failures yourself. For example, what will happen is that if you request the transfer of uh, for the Temporal service, it will call your code and it will call the withdraw operation, which will be routed for the Temporal server to the so-called activities, which implement withdraw operation, which will end up calling your bank. And then um, it will return back to the uh, workflow code, which will initiate deposit, for example. And imagine that at this point, this uh, process fails. And the Temporal do, uh, does a very interesting thing. It will recover your process on a, usually a different machine because this process probably never comes back. Um, or if it comes back on the same machine, on a different machine, it will go and recover the state of that program <clears throat> on, uh, in exactly the state it was. And when I mean exactly the state, it means all local variables, all threads, all data in your classes. And uh, for pr this process, will not even notice that machine failed. So when you write code, you don't need to care for the failure of the process which runs this code. And it's very powerful because in this case, process failed. We are still in the same deposit operation, still waiting on this to complete. And when it completes, our program will complete. So, uh, it, so it means that you need to, uh, to fear that uh, process fails in the middle of withdrawal deposit. It kind of guarantees that if uh, your systems are operational, that at the end, this transaction will complete. And uh, this is kind of the main value proposition of Temporal. It allows you to write normal code, and this code is uh, fault tolerant. And uh, we'll spend more time on that, explaining how this magic works. Uh, so uh, now I, I'll, I'll uh, give a chance uh, to show you actual code, and, uh, and Tihamir will do, do a demo, and uh, then we'll continue the slides. Mm. Should I stop sharing? Uh, uh, I'll try to share now. Uh, how do I stop? Uh, oops. Okay. All right. There we go. All right. So, hi, everybody. Uh, just to show, uh, kind of continue from what Maxime has uh, showed us so far. I uh, wanted to show a quick demo and demo <laughs> the actual money uh, transfer workflow that we started describing uh, as, as, as uh, using Temporal as a solution. So here I'm in my IDE. Uh, as you can see, this is the code that also we have uh, shown in the slides. And the core value proposition, as Maxime said, is that you can write uh, simple code and allow Temporal to handle uh, a lot of these different um, problems and solve them for us. So here we have a little uh, money transfer workflow class. It has our transfer method. And just like is in the slides, we've shown uh, two lines of code, very simple, which is account withdraw and <coughs> account deposit. Um, the accounts class here is uh, our activities, which are the classes that are actually going to communicate with the different banking services. And what Tempora allows you to do is configure these activities uh, via configurations. And as you see here, we uh, use activity options to define some information about uh, the execution of our activities. For example, we can set a max amount of time, so we can set a different number of timeouts. We can also set uh, different retry options in temporal uh, activities or um, are retried by default, which is great. But you can also set a couple of things uh, in as far as for our demo, what we're going to see when an activity retries, for example, a downstream service such as our banking service might experience downtime. We want each uh, interval, I mean, retry not to take over uh, 10 seconds. So this is just for demo purposes because there is some back of coefficient and each retry will take uh, a little longer than the one before. 
as far as our activities goes, we can see these are this is an account uh, service activities class, and this is really your code. In this case, uh, what we do is simulate, for example, if uh, some sort of banking client, this banking client can be there's some sort of client that allows you to talk to the downstream uh, banking services or any other service via REST, or if you're using, for example, an event-driven architecture, maybe describing um, how to communicate to sending events to a particular um, messaging broker in order to communicate to our uh, third-line banking systems. And here it's really our uh, code that, that we have. Uh, one thing is that I wanted to show is uh, for the test, our withdraw is actually going to pre perform a withdraw, but for our deposit operation, we are going to actually for this demo at first simulate an error. So meaning that in this demo, we're going to uh, simulate that our bank, which uh, handles our deposits of the money transfer uh, is either down or has some sort of intermittent problem that we want to recover from and see how temporal uh, will allow us to do that. So in, now that we have our workflow definition, which is just plain code, and, and we didn't, as Maxim said, have to deal with a lot of the issues uh, of implementing fault-tolerant um, <clears throat> microservices and, and, and orchestration of those, uh, we have a little starter. This is our client application. This simulates, as, as seen on the slide, a little client that actually wants to initialize or, or start the execution of our workflow and our money transfer. And here we use the uh, temporal SDK code. This is all written in Java uh, to start the workflow execution and then later on wait for re results and then print some status. So let's go ahead and um, start an instance of our money transfer workflow. Just one second. All right, so we see that our workflow money transfer workflow has started. I'll make this a little bigger. And we can see that our workflow status is currently in the running state. Now, what we want to do is what we can do is go to the temporal web UI. And this is an application that, um, that communicates also, uh, gets information from the temporal server as far as what workflows are currently running and things like that. And we do see that we have a workflow uh, execution currently that is in the running status with the workflow ID. This is a business level uh, ID that we have provided when we started the workflow execution. And it has also a run ID. Now, when we click on uh, the run ID, we can see some information. Again, the status, the workflow ID. We can see the input that was received from the client, such as our to and from uh, account information, a reference ID, and uh, the amount of uh, the currency that has to be transferred between these banks. We can also see that uh, it, we have no pending activities currently running. And why is that? Because if you see the task queue, you can think of task queues such as endpoints on the server that uh, the client that uh, uh, the workflow kind of listens to our client has to listen to in order to continue or, or execute our workflow in, uh, implementation. We have currently uh, no pollers, meaning that there is no workers or pollers currently looking at this particular task or endpoint in order to uh, start execution of our workflow. So let's go ahead and go back to our application. We also have a little worker. Now, important thing is that since this is just a demo, all of these uh, are run in the same uh, kind of uh, project or pro uh, service, but uh, the client itself can be a service. And then the worker, uh, this code here can also run in, in a completely different service. So the worker itself is a, a worker that we create and we set it uh, for the same task queue as what our client has uh, started the work for, in this case, the money transfer task queue. So let's go ahead and start this worker. And when we start it, <clears throat> we will see that we're getting our simulated exception during deposit. So let's see what actually happened. And if we refresh the page, we can see here that uh, our workflow execution has started and we have some pending activities. The activity that is currently pending is our deposit activity. And uh, we can also see uh, that it 
has an error, in which case we can see the error here, which is our simulated exception during the deposit. So basically our demo is saying, as we've shown in the code, that our banking, uh, banking service where we need to deposit a transfer to currently experiences a downtime or intermittent errors. Um, so another thing that's really cool that we can see is our retries. We can see the time of when next a retry will happen. And another thing that you, we can see in our IDE is that our work, uh, our workflow keeps retrying, temporal keeps retrying uh, our activity uh, until this intermittent error has been fixed. So let's go ahead and try to fix our error. So if our go with our uh, activities, uh, we can actually do two things. We can fix the code, but one more thing I wanted to show is um, the history. We also have Temporal uh, provides uh, a lot of information. So it shows every single event that happened, but it doesn't only show the events. It also has a lot of uh, information from, um, our code itself, for example, we have a workflow type, which is our money transfer workflow we have started. And also for activities execution, we can see the activity uh, withdraw. Whoops, sorry, I'll go back. One second, yeah. And we can see our activity schedule, our activity name, our retry options that we have defined and everything like that. Now, the cool thing about this that what we can do is we can actually uh, go to our IDE and go to our terminal and we can use our um, the temporal CLI and actually describe this information there too. All we need is our uh, workflow ID and we can actually see everything that has happened so far as well. So let's go ahead and fix our uh, activity code. In our activity, we can just change this to perform deposit. And we can just go ahead and restart our worker. So we're going to stop the worker. Now, when we start it back up, uh, as we see, we stopped our worker. But if we see in the summary, our workflow execution is still in the run running status. Uh, and if we start the worker back up, which will um, include the fixes to our intermittent error of our deposit service, we can see that the workflow has uh, uh, been able to uh, complete. So, uh, and we have actually seen that the workflow execution started completed as well. And if we look now here in our UI, we see the workflow has, is in the complete status. And we can see in the summary that we've been able to recover from the error and, and we're able to complete both the, the uh, both of our activities and our transfer is complete. Now, one thing I wanted to show again inside of the terminal is we can again describe the workflow. And the cool thing about if you're running in your IDEs, if you look at the workflow history, uh, whenever an error happened, you can actually not only uh, directly navigate to the code where the particular exception uh, during workflow execution has happened. I'll make this a little smaller so we can see this better. Uh, but also what you can do is you can use this workflow history to actually locally replay uh, a workflow that has run in production. So if you have a production uh, workflow that, for example, you ran and it completed either uh, successfully or failed, you can take this um, history uh, from here or using, again, TCTL and replay um, it um, locally and, and see exactly where the error happens and debug it as well in your ideas. All right, so that's kind of like for the demo. And now I'm going to send it back to Maxime to, to uh, explore. So uh, uh, Tico showed you a Java sample. Uh, we already have uh, four SDKs, so you can write your workflows in Java, you can write them in Go and activities, uh, you can write them in PHP and uh, TypeScript. Uh, Python and .NET uh, will come later uh, ne next year, uh, but uh, right now, and you also can interpret. Atiko has an awesome example when you have a single uh, application written in all four languages, 
and they interoperate with each other. So you can absolutely call activities uh, like workflow in Java can call activities in TypeScript, TypeScript workflow ty TypeScript uh, can call child workflow in PHP and so on. So, uh, so you can think this is a uh, kind of service implemented in different languages. Uh, and uh, 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 so it's very powerful. So other thing is that as you're using normal language, uh, you can keep using your existing tools. So you can use your existing frameworks, you can uh, uh, use your IDEs. Uh, we showed you uh, IntelliJ, but you absolutely can use uh, any IDE you want because it's just normal Java code or TypeScript code. Uh, you can uh, use uh, deploy your workers uh, practically code, which runs your application workflows and activities any way you want. You can run them in Kubernetes, Docker, and so on. And uh, you can uh, we support you uh, testing and unit testing and uh, in every language which uh, we have in SDK. So you, you don't need to move from your like preferred tools to uh, get the uh, benefits of Temporal. So now I, I will kind of spend a little bit more time explaining how it, uh, this magic works internally. Because we say it recovers, we say it uh, preserves state, but how does it happen? It's actually pretty simple. Uh, the basic idea is that there is a temporal service, so all communication happens through that. And for example, when uh, we ran this uh, uh, transfer application, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we, uh, we made a request to the temporal service, uh, and this temporal server exposes gRPC interface. So this communication temporal uh, is always through gRPC, but it's hidden from you because you're using SDKs, uh, which we provide. And when the request comes in, uh, two things will happen. The actual workflow history will be updated in workflow state inside of the uh, temporal service. And also uh, temporal service has queues, we call them task queues, uh, which are practically like queues, and we will put task there. And what's important, the temporal is fully transactional consistent service. So this task will appear uh, and uh, updates to the state of the uh, workflow will be trans fully transactional. So if workflow starts, we guarantee there is no risk condition between creating tasks. Uh, practically messages in the queue and uh, um, updating state, which is very important because, as I mentioned, if you do homegrown system, you rarely have such transactions. Uh, and then uh, the, this worker which we ran, it contained workflow code. It pull, uh, it listens on the task queue, and it will receive that task and starts executing that. So task will contain information which workflow type it should execute and the input output arg input arguments. So it will start running that. It will hit the withdraw method, uh, withdraw operation. This operation is a blocking operation. So it will end up blocking the workflow and it will emit command uh, back to execute activity withdraw to the service. Uh, service will uh, go in transaction and create a task uh, to execute that uh, activity and also the update state in the history of the workflow. Then activity worker will pick it up, execute the task and it can be any, and uh, we support very long running tasks because activity uh, can heartbeat. So this task can take five, 10 days, or it, uh, if it fails, it will be retried for, we don't have limits how long it can be retried. So you can retry for months if necessary. And then it will call the service and uh, and then it will uh, complete the, um, and report back to the service, the result of this uh, operation. And then uh, when we report the result, it will create a task for the workflow to pick up, workflow will pick it up and it will continue executing, producing new command, and then like imagine this uh, worker failed in the middle of uh, processing this task. Uh, what Temporal will do, it simply will, uh, it has a timeout for processing this, what we call workflow task. And this task will appear again in the task queue uh, in, uh, after the timeout. Uh, default, I think is 10 seconds. And then uh, workflow will pick it up. And then it will, uh, what it will do, it will actually recover the state of the workflow, as I said, to exactly the same point before the failure. So if it was waiting on deposit and trying to do deposit command, it will do exactly the same thing. So you don't need to deal with failure at all. So this kind of retry happens um, automatically by uh, the temporal SDK. So you're, you're, you don't need to program uh, write any code for that. You still have these two lines of code. And it will produce the command, which is deposit command. And it will go and uh, hit the deposit activity, which will report back and uh, report back to the workflow for the workflow task and it will complete the workflow. We will report completion. And at some point, uh, if client uh, waits for the workflow completion, it doesn't need to wait for that, but if it waits for that, it will be notified. So this is kind of how the interaction between activities and workflows goes. And uh, it's kind of this pinpoint of these tasks between workflows and activities. And as every task is always protected by timeout, activity task, workflow task, 
if uh, this uh, failure happens in the middle, this task just retry it. And this is kind of the basic idea. So the most interesting magic here is what happens then the worker dies uh, while uh, waiting on some operation, right? For example, if uh, our workflow called withdraw and uh, withdraw is happening through the service in the background, this activity worker, and then the process which uh, hosts this workflow code dies. And uh, I mentioned a few times that we will recover state to exactly the same point with exactly the same variables and um, um, like threads and so on. How do we do that? We actually uh, use a very simple mechanism. We call it replay. Practically what will happen is then this uh, worker will um, come back or another worker will pick up the task. The worker will receive that execution history of the workflow and uh, which uh, Tiho showed then in UI. Um, and uh, we practically record everything which happened to the workflow. And then we'll take your uh, code and run that code from the beginning. Practically what we will do, we will find that over oh, is transfer function. We will start running that. It will uh, call withdraw. Withdraw is a blocking operation. But at this point, we are not going to call service back. If this decay, this decay, which um, like in this case, Java is decay, will cache the so-called command which is will be schedule activity withdraw command in its memory. And uh, then it will, uh, as the workflow is blocked, uh, it, but there is more history. So it will keep, start working the history. And at some point it will find activity that scheduled command, which act, uh, event, which actually corresponds to the command. This event is in the history because this command is duplicate. It's already was emitted before. So, uh, and we are replaying because we are recovering state, but we don't want to make this withdrawal again because it already happened. So the system will detect that and uh, uh, practically remove this command, dedupe that command. And then it will, uh, because our workflow is still blocked on the withdraw operation, it will uh, conti uh, continue working the history because it cannot make progress on the workflow itself. But then it will find activity task completed event and this event corresponds to the uh, result, uh, contains the result of the withdraw operation. And uh, so at this point, we can unblock the withdraw. In this case, we don't return any data, but uh, operation can return data. And uh, activity task completed event contains the output of the, of the, um, of the activity. And uh, so it will unblock and it, a workflow can uh, continue executing. In this case, it goes to the next line. The next line is deposit and will schedule deposit activity. And workflow is blocked again, so we need to go to the history back and start working uh, like processing new events in the history. In this case, we reach the end of the history. And uh, why we've got this history? Because we already kind of recorded everything which happened before. Now we are not now recovering. But after we recover it and executed, uh, went through the whole history, we see one command, which is deposit command. And this is the command which will send back to the service for execution. So what you see is that because we have history and history contains a record of everything which happened in our workflow before, uh, that uh, it's, uh, we uh, can just execute a workflow function from the beginning, dedupe all the operations it's already did, and then only send out the new command. Uh, there is one big, big assumption here is that this workflow code is so-called deterministic. What it means is that it will go and take the same path are given the same set of uh, the same history, the same set of events. For example, if your workflow does something like if random, like less than five, uh, take this branch, call this activity, else call other activity, this code will not be valid for temporal because it's not deterministic, because random will take different path every time. So you want to run random, use a special random that temporal provides, which will deterministically uh, take the same code path. The same thing for time. You cannot use system time, you need to use workflow time. So we'll provide the deterministic time. Also, you cannot call the uh, external services directly from the workflow code for the same reason, because calling them is not deterministic. So that's why we have activities. So you call any external operations for activities, uh, but workflow is orchestrates those activities in a deterministic manner. I can ask for more questions if you have about that later. So uh, I, I mentioned temporal service itself. Uh, so, uh, and uh, kind of showed that in the box. But most important thing is that temporal service itself is just a binary. It's a goal. Uh, it's written in Golang, and it sits on top of a database. It can use uh, MySQL, uh, Postgres, and Cassandra right now, and uh, I think it's also um, SQLite. And uh, more databases can be added later. And uh, you deploy this binary any way you want. You can deploy it in bare metal. Uh, you can deploy it uh, in Docker, uh, Kubernetes, uh, and uh, a different like on a 
all sort of, uh, I think people use also HashiCorp Nomad and so on. And uh, also temporal um, via, via business. Uh, uh, so we, uh, the only way we monetize is providing, uh, hosting this service in the cloud. So we have our own cloud offering. So if uh, some company doesn't want to run temporal service themselves, they can pay us money and we will host it for them. You still run your code because your workers, uh, the uh, code which contains your workflow and activity code runs on your premises, runs in your VPC. It just needs to connect through gRPC to the temporal service in the cloud or with the, where it's deployed. So no, we didn't have many much time, but um, I can answer any questions about the uh, temporal itself. Uh.